Hi, busy students. Uh, yesterday, we left off at the end with measuring the market. We looked at market size as one mechanism for measuring versus market share. Um, and we talked about the fact that there are several ways in which you could calculate those measurements. So today we're going to move on. We are going to look at those concepts a little bit more today and what they might mean for a business and how a business might respond to where they sit in those scales. Um, but before we do that, you're going to pause in this Ed Puzzle and you're going to answer a question because it is time for a question break. So this is probably going to take you 10 to 15 minutes um, and then head on back to the video. So here's your question. So hopefully you were okay with that question and had a bit of a go at it. Don't stress, it's just a chance to practice, okay? We're now going to look more in depth at the characteristics of the market. So I introduced this now. Market size is an element of that, but it's sort of outside of that because it's also a tool. It's, it's a measurement tool. So what we're going to look at now is what market size means in terms of characteristics, but I'm also going to talk you through some of the other characteristics a market will have that will contribute to how a firm makes marketing decisions, okay? Because remember, part of marketing is market research. And the more a firm knows about its market and the characteristics of its markets, the better prepared it can be to compete in those markets. So just at the really basic end, a market is any place or process whereby consumers and suppliers trade. Now, you'll see a range of definitions out there for what a market is, um, and you certainly don't have to use this one word for word. Um, the key components to have, though, in any definition of a market, um, some recognition that it is a space, whether it be a physical place or an online transaction, um, and that it involves an interaction or engagement between consumers and suppliers or consumers and producers or firms and customers, any of that language is fine, um, resulting in a trade of some kind, okay? Again, you don't have to use the word trade. It can, the word ex exchange can be used, um, transaction, uh, receipt of good in return for fine, whatever you, that language is fine, um, as long as you've got those key elements within that definition. So now that we've got the boring definitional stuff out of the way, when we look at a market, there are a range of characteristics we're interested in, okay? And every market will pretty much have these characteristics. What they look like for a specific market will vary, but these are the headings. These are the things you're looking for. So the first one obviously is size, and we talked last lesson about how you can you can measure the size of, an, of a market, and I am, like I said, going to come back to that. So I'm going to move on from that right now. The next element is customer base, and this can be a bit like size, um, except size can mean the value of the market. You know, we recognize that sales value was one of the measures, um, so how much it's worth, but that might be quite a small customer base. So if you think of something like commodities, okay, the sale of commodities, um, there aren't lots of customers. It might be worth billions of dollars, but the actual number of I don't want to say organizations, but the number of customers you can have, which will predominantly be governments or organizations, um, is very limited, okay? And what that means is that even though it's worth billions, if you lose one customer or two customers, it's significant. It also means there's limited opportunity for expansion if that was something you were interested in looking into. Um, so customer base is kind of separated out from size when we look at the market characteristics because customer base helps us know things like, is there expansion possibility? Can I change the direction of my market? Not just how much is the market worth? Another characteristic that's important to look at are the barriers to entry. This is not just important if you're looking at getting into a market. Obviously, it is important then because you need to know how hard is it going to be to enter the market. But it's also important when you're in the market because it tells you how easily new competitors can enter. So barriers to entry can include things like the startup cost. So how expensive is it going to be for you to start your business? Um, it can also include legal limitations. So do you need licensing to run your particular industry? Is there certification involved? You know, do you have to have government approval to start your business? Um, it can include things like the fact that Particular goods are copyright or patent protected, so intellectual property gets in the way of you trying to produce similar goods. Um, 
So there are lots of things that can be barriers to entry. Physical space and you don't have physical space, right? So things like that mean it's harder for people to enter the market. And if it's harder for them to enter, it's harder for competition to be created, okay? And if you're already in, that's brilliant news. If you're not already in, that might make it really hard for you to catch up. Aside from barriers to entry, though, we also look at competition on its own. So how much competition is in the market now? Is there a lot? Is there a little? How influential is it? So is it strong competitors or is it lots of little itty bitty competitors who they're not really going to have an effect on your business? Um, you know, is the competition structure of the market really spread out? Like there are lots of them, but you've, you've got a tiny little area you're targeting and therefore it's not an issue. Um, or is there like the competitor who's dominated the market for the last 20 years and therefore you may be never going to overtake them? We care about geographic features. This is important not just for physical businesses. Obviously, for a physical business, there's the particular issue around like where you locate um, and the space required and any manufacturing, etc. But even as an online business, you need to think about things like shipping routes, access to ports, what it's, how long it's going to take you to distribute to your target market, okay? Okay. Um, is weather going to be a factor? So are there like seasonal weather elements of your geography that are going to prohibit production? You know, are you a farmer? So geographic features are, are important to consider. Socio-demographic features, all oh, customer bases have them. So who are the people around you? Okay. And when we talk about the socio-demographic features of a market, you don't have to limit it to your target market. Although obviously at some point you identify the socio-demographic group you're targeting. But who else is in the market? Because you want to know who you can potentially expand to in future. So that factors in things like age, ethnicities, gender, um, wealth background, educational background, okay? All of those things factor in to your socio-demographic measures. We want to know about the market growth rate. So particularly for industries that have been going for a little bit longer, what's the average growth rate like? You know, how fast is it growing? Is there potential for it to grow? Is it slowing down? Why might it be slowing down? Okay. And then lastly, you've got cyclical characteristics. Sometimes you'll see this written as seasonal characteristics. Either or and both is fine. Um, basically, we're talking about are there any things in your market that might not always be constant but always come back? So obviously seasons themselves are a cyclical characteristic. So if you're a farmer, you care about seasons. Uh, if you are a fashion designer or if you're a clothing manufacturer, you care about seasons. Uh, if you are a business that connects strongly with festivities, you care about whatever the festivities are wherever you are because they're cyclical. You might respond to them annually. You might change product or marketing tactic around those festivities, okay? So these cyclical characteristics are things that you're not always going to have, but you're always going to think about. Okay, so that's kind of the outline that if you were going to research a market, these are the things you want to know about it. But obviously then if you're in the market, you're also interested in your market share and how it relates to other organizations. So last lesson I introduced the notion of talking about market size and market share. And we talked about market share being the piece of the pie, the section of the industry that your business has control over, okay, or has, you know, a dominance in. And it can be measured with your sales revenue or your volume. Now, if you look at the textbook on this, it only uses the sales revenue calculation. Um, you can use either. Generally speaking, sales revenue is what we're interested in. Um, I said yesterday that sometimes we're interested in volume because we want to know about like market spread. And obviously, if we price differently in things, sales revenue will differ. But fundamentally, as a business and as someone interested in their finance, like shareholders, etc., most people are going to be interested in their sales revenue is in terms of market share. They want to know how much of the dollars out there are being picked up by your business. So sales revenue is probably the more common calculation used. Now, there are some features about market share that you need to be aware of. There is a generally positive rate relationship between market share and profit. So, for example, the higher my market share, the more likely I am to be making a healthy profit. 
Having said that, the phrase is more likely. It is not an absolute, okay? It is entirely possible that you have lots of market share and you are creating losses or you have lower profits than your competitors with less market share. Perhaps because the way you're doing that is you've just got scale. You're just selling to a lot more people but at lower prices and therefore your profit level is lower, okay? Um, So just keep in mind that they are positively related but not guaranteed. Now, high market share makes an organization a market leader, okay? So if you have sufficiently high market share, you can become a market leader and that means that you have power within the market. You have competitive power. You can now make decisions and other firms and customers are going to follow you, okay, because you've got a degree of influence because of that market power. And this is because market leaders often benefit from economies of scale. You know, once you start to saturate and get that sort of high market share value, you're now able to expand to a level that you can achieve an economy of scale, charge lower prices, get more market share. You see where I'm going with this? It becomes a bit of a a never-ending cycle. And this market leadership also creates power for you and the ability to set prices. Now, I'm not going to go too much into this because this isn't an economics lesson. Um, But the basic theory behind this is that the more market power you have, the bigger your customer base. If you make a change and other firms don't follow, they'll lose customers, okay? So you have the ability largely to do what you like. You've got enough customers, enough brand loyalty to set the prices. You've got enough unique selling point to differentiate you from the rest of the market And if for whatever reason you decide to lower prices, perhaps to catch more of the market, everyone else is going to have to follow immediately because if they don't, their customers are just going to jump to you anyway. So you have quite a bit of price setting ability. Um, And of course, you're also less threatened by the competition because of that power. Now, some of the ways that firms can improve market share, they can increase the promotion of their brand, okay, so or create a brand. So not all businesses, as you know, have a, a brand they're just a business. But having a brand creates brand loyalty. So promotion of a particular brand or image can improve your market share. They can improve, change, innovate their products. Okay. So product development, okay, is a key part of improving market share. Um, If you're a service industry, staff motivation and training to improve the quality of that service is important. Um, another way to do it, and I mentioned this in barriers to entry, is to establish property rights. So if you can copyright, patent, use any form of intellectual property mechanism to protect your good um, that you're offering, other people can't produce it and therefore you capture the market for that good, okay? So the creation of property rights is a key way to knock out or prevent competitors getting into your market. Um, And of course, improving the efficiency of your distribution channels. The more efficient you are at getting your product from you to your consumer, the more consumers are going to be willing to engage with your product. So we have market share and we know that high market share leads to market leadership. But the other factor we want to think about is not just what you as a firm have control over, but we also want to look at how competitive the market is as a whole like is there lots of competition or is there only a little bit of competition and just a few really dominant firms and we do that by looking at the market concentration so our market concentration measures the degree of competition okay that exists in your market and it does this by taking several dominant firms okay and looking at how much market share those firms have And what they do with that is they create a calculation. We call it the concentration ratio. And the concentration ratio tells us the percentage of power that those dominant firms have in your market. So we express this as CR, concentration ratio. And you'll see on the screen in front of you, I've written four. Now, the number that goes next to CR is the number of dominant firms that were measured. Okay, so CR4, if you've looked at four dominant firms within the market, CR10, you'd never really go much beyond 10 unless it was a hugely competitive market, okay? So 
if I look at, say, let's say CR10 equals 80%, that would be the, so my concentration ratio, looking at ten, the 10 most dominant firms, so the 10 market leaders, is 90%. Now, that means that of the whole market, however many other firms are out there, those 10 firms control 90% of the market. It's not particularly competitive, okay? Now, if instead, when I measured those 10 firms, my concentration ratio came back as 20%, well, yeah, that's not a huge percentage of the market, okay? So this percentage tells us a high concentration ratio would indicate that there's a really limited competition. There aren't that many competitors out there. There's a few dominant firms. They control everything. If the ratio is low, it signals that there are lots of competitors out there, okay? And that there's lots of competition and everyone's just got a little piece of the pie and probably no one is dominating in terms of market leadership. You can pretty much do what you like, okay? So this market concentration helps us identify, firstly, how hard is it going to be to compete in the market? Because if those market leaders have a lot of power, if that concentration ratio is high, you're going to have trouble establishing economies of scale and other factors that allow you to compete on price, quality, and range, okay? Their sheer dominance is going to prevent that. Um, And that then tells us also a little bit about how the firms will behave. Now, I'm not going to go any further into that because after that, it drifts way into economics. You do not calculate concentration ratio, as in you, IB students, do not do that. Um, You just need to know that a high ratio indicates very limited competition and a low ratio signals lots of competition. All right then, so it's time for another question break. I'm going to leave you with Edpuzzle for a minute and then we're going to come back. So here's your question. So you've been through your Edpuzzle. Hopefully it wasn't too hard. The last part we're going to look at is marketing objectives. So Marketing objectives are our aims. What are we trying to achieve as a marketing function? Remember, this is not what are my promotional objectives, although that's a factor. It's what are my marketing objectives? What am I trying to do when I decide price, product, place, promotion? Note how I'm using a lot of P's. We're going to be looking at P's next lesson. So my marketing objectives, we split them between for-profit and not-for-profit. Now, remember I said that Um, You've got commercial marketing and social marketing. This is a bit the same, um, except that when we talked about commercial and social, we said largely the marketing mechanisms are going to be similar. That's true for for for-profit and non-for-profit, but the fundamental aims are going to be different and that might affect some of the decisions made. So your for-profit organization, they are aiming to increase sales revenue. That's what they want to do. They might be looking to increase their market share They might want to increase their market power by getting more leadership within that market share. The goal might be to improve brand awareness or product awareness, okay, to develop and launch new products onto the market or to enhance brand perception. Note I separated out improve brand awareness from enhance brand perception and that's because one is about getting people to know about your product, improving brand awareness. And the other, enhancing brand awareness, is about, I'm sorry, enhancing brand perception is about improving people's image of your business. So they know about your brand, but they maybe don't think of it the way you want them to think of it, okay? So some of these goals are going to be in contradiction with each other. For example, I might find it hard to increase sales revenue at a time when I am trying to improve my brand awareness because to improve brand awareness, I might want to launch a whole bunch of sales. Okay, lower my prices, get lots of people in and suddenly my sales revenue is not so great. That's okay, okay? And this is why we think about these things when making our key marketing decisions. Our nonprofit organizations, they're more worried about things like building membership or support for their cause, their issue, whatever it is that they are operating in. They want to build support around that. They might want to generate awareness of an issue. Okay, remember, not all nonprofits offer a physical support function. So you've got some like um, Salvation Army, St. Vincent de Paul, uh, Red Cross, okay, sort of. Um, 
that they offer a service almost or goods and services. They've got a function, a physical provide something function. But other nonprofits are purely issue driven. So think things like PETA, okay, um, World Wildlife Fund, Amnesty International. These are all nonprofits that they don't really do a thing. <laughs> They, they promote issues, they generate awareness, they get people involved in causes, okay? Um, they still have a goal around brand recognition, okay? That's still a thing. Um, they want to create positive attention for operations and this is sometimes where nonprofits fall over. Um, you can think about things like organisations like Greenpeace that have had some massively disastrous public relations in past decades, Um and obviously, they, they want to demonstrate their organisational value to the society, to the community. They, they're trying to get people to understand why they exist. So these aims will guide our decision making as an organisation as we move forward into our strategy for marketing objective, for marketing. Now, marketing strategy is here and it's where we're going to go to next lesson. But I'm going to pause at this point because I suspect you'll have taken a bit of time with your questions. If you haven't, feel free to go to the slides and read the last slide on marketing strategy. That's where I will start next lesson. But other than that, good work today.